Hey there, this is Chris Mailing with 10 Pound Gorilla. I'm a business analyst and project manager, and today we're going to be taking a look at auditing CSS load performance. Um, over the last few presentation topics that we've had, we've been talking about Tailwind versus Bootstrap and also how we segment our CSS from our DNN themes and the modules that we develop with being primarily too sexy and easy DNN news. And so I wanted to do a little bit of a review on some sites in the DNN ecosystem and to look at how CSS files are being loaded, how many of them are there, and what is the file size for those. And wrapping it all up, what is the potential to improve the loading experience for CSS, regardless if we are using Bootstrap or Tailwind. So um, after finding a mixture of DNN websites, I found eight for this sample size um, that are using either Tailwind or Bootstrap. Um, I went to the homepage of the site using my browser tools. I was able to um, view all of the CSS files that were loading. And then I was able to log the CSS file that is being loaded. What's the file size for it? Uh, and is it minified or not? And I also tried to log if the CSS file that is loading is coming from DNN uh, by default or as a core uh, library, and then also if it is coming from a third-party module. And so that will tell us three different sources of where our, our CSS is coming from, again, being DNN, a module, or from our theme or skin itself. And then in this presentation, I've linked our uh, spreadsheet that we have where we can review the data from this review. So jumping into it, uh, quick takeaway here is that this is a very small sample size. We're looking at eight different websites. Um, you could do more comprehensive testing, pull up more sites, even do more uh, pages on each site to get a better overall uh, view of, of the amount of CSS that is loading. And um, two of the Tailwind sites that I, I pulled up um, were loading a pretty large um, or massive, rather, uh, bootstrap. Actually, it was a Font Awesome Pro uh, library, and that file was 669 kilobytes, which is large. And if you exclude those two files, loading um, is larger than the average uh, site CSS load in general. So it's a pretty massive file um, and one of the takeaways that we'll have when we get closer towards the end of this video. So um, when we look at the websites and we rank them according to the uh, amount of CSS that they load, um, we can see we have one site in particular, 1.1 megabyte in total size, 963 kilobytes for site number six. Uh, the first site that we reviewed is 535 kilobytes and the smallest all the way down to 320 kilobytes. I'm sure you could push lower than 320 kilobytes getting to smaller footprints for websites. Uh, just takes a bit of optimization for that. Uh, we can also see in this column, third column, number of CSS files, uh, the total number of CSS that is loading, and then we have our framework listed on the right-hand side. So looking at some key takeaways, I think the biggest one here is getting CSS minification put into your daily process for whenever you're writing or updating code. When we look at the total number of CSS files that are loading, there are 66 of them across the eight websites. 27 of those are minified and 39 are not minified. So we're looking at 40, 41% of CSS files being minified currently. So there is a pretty large opportunity to uh, improve some um, load performance and best practices by implementing um, some minification. Uh, in total, there's 3.8 uh, megabytes of CSS loading across all eight sites with an average load per site at 485 kilobytes. When we look at websites one through five, the total uh, CSS load is 1.6, 1.7 uh, megabytes. If we were to go in and minimize all of that CSS, that puts us down to 1.37 or close to 1.4 megabytes. That is a savings of 18% in CSS loading bandwidth, which uh, goes a long way towards making improvements in the website load time. Uh, and with that, if we're able to empty uh, implement optimizations or minification of CSS that would result in about 90 kilobytes of CSS save um, per site or per page view, technically. Um, looking at our second key takeaway is that we really need to be mindful about the CSS files that we're loading. Um, two of those, again, did include a Font Awesome Pro CSS library, uh, which was 669 kilobytes. 
that is massive and we would like to avoid that where possible. With the Pro license, you should be able to create custom font packs so you can pick the individual fonts or icons that you want to use and include that in a smaller subset, giving you a much lower footprint for what you load. You could also look to use SVGs to render your icons on the site instead of using a font pack for it. Um, there's always a, a, a balance in this process, right? You, you want to be able to give your content editors a nice library of icons to work with and select as they work with and maintain the site. But you also want to avoid it from becoming uh, too large and having load performance impacts. All right, so one of the takeaways that I was seeing is saving 100 kilobytes sounds great, but in the grand scheme of things, for most users on mobile devices or desktop computers, um, 100 kilobytes doesn't make a huge difference in load performance. Uh, in 2021, the average mobile internet user in the US had a download speed of 21 megabytes per second. In 2023, that's looking to be 27 megabytes per second. 100 kilobytes not really making a huge difference in the um, grand scheme of things for the load. But when we talk about making incremental improvements for our websites, uh, reducing the total number of files that we load, reducing the amount of CSS that we load, compressing our images, all of these little things um, come into play to provide a better optimized and performant website. So uh, while I'm skeptical a bit that 100 kilobytes is going to make a large difference for end users, it's all about these small changes that we can have um, collectively larger impacts on. So looking at loading files individually, uh, this led me to looking at the request timings or what is referred to as the waterfall when you make a request to a file. Uh, typically, files are going to go through a series of steps to ultimately um, make the request to the server, uh, receive the file, and then to display it on the page or to render it in, into the page. So uh, we can see the uh, steps listed uh, vertically here in this table and then also horizontally in the waterfall. Um, one of the really big red flags for me here is this blocked step, which is the first one here. And essentially, a uh, browser has a default number of requests that it can make to any particular website that you're going to um, just to prevent overloading that server. And so Firefox limits the maximum number of requests that you can make to a particular domain to six requests at a time. And any additional requests get put in this blocked status where they're waiting in a queue to be able to go and make that request. And so this particular file that we're looking at had 56 milliseconds time where it was blocked and unable to do anything. Then it had 55 milliseconds where it is waiting for DNS resolution, 20 milliseconds where it makes a connection to the server, 43 milliseconds where we receive the, um, or waiting for that, that response and then displaying it in the page. So um, going to this key takeaway, really consolidating our files where we can is gonna have a pretty big impact, I think, um, in comparison in some regards to the CSS that we load, the amount of CSS that we load, because um, in this case, almost 70% of the CSS load was just waiting or trying to make a connection to the DNS. Um, and so this allows us to save some potential uh, loading overhead. So I have another example here. Um, in this particular case, we have a website that is loading Owl Carousel. Um, there are two referenced files we can see here on lines, looks like three and four. One is 3.3 kilobytes and another is one kilobyte. Uh, this is actually connecting to a CDN, which should be incredibly fa fast. And it should also be able to bypass some of the blocked type processing that a browser is imposing to re prevent you from making too many requests at one given time. But we can see that 183 milliseconds of this request was just blocked waiting to get in its position to make the request. It was delivered almost immediately, and then it was a 50 sec 56 millisecond um, waiting and delivery. So 238 milliseconds complete time to wait, make the request, wait for it, and receive it. And then 183 milliseconds um, could have been saved had we been able to essentially consolidate this into additional CSS. So in some regards, taking the owl carousel and theme CSS and merging it into our theme as part of our CSS build, building one file for that um, reduces that blocked status. It doesn't have to wait because it's already um, being queued in another request. 
All right, so looking at some takeaways and action items, this is something um, for our internal team, but it's also something I would highly recommend for anyone going through building websites, not even specifically to DNN. Whenever you're building a website, you should have a checklist of things you do before you go live. These are things that are very easy to um, forget about or just um, you know fail to do. And um, you know some of these are things like making sure you have uh, Avacon listed, making sure in DNN the pre-generated terms and privacy pages look good, um, making sure your images are compressed and optimized and going to perform well doing cross-browser and accessibility testing. We have a pretty healthy checklist uh, for our sites, to say the least. But um, things that we should be including to those is to make sure we're doing a check that all of our CSS, where we can, is minified. We should be auditing our CSS and to make sure that we have no unexpected massive files that we want to review and potentially remove. In this case, looking at um, the Font Awesome Pro, that would be a big red flag that we want to go through and find ways to reduce that overall load. Um, DNN also can output some default CSS styling. Um, in some sites, this isn't being used. So identifying what is the trigger that is causing that? Can we remove it? Can we reduce that CSS load overall? And then part of our process is just making sure that we are up to make updating our boilerplate and uh, implementing processes to automatically uh, compile our SAS into CSS and to automatically minify that, which is something that we can solve for with our terminal commands with a SAS watch. So all of these processes are going to help us deliver uh, better, uh, more performant websites for our end users following best practices that are outlined by Google and other search engines. Um, if you have any questions about uh, CSS load performance or you would like any recommendations or guidance on your site, feel free to drop us an email at our support ticket, which is help at 10poundgorilla.com. Thanks so much for your time. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our Gorilla Learning Lab. We have a lot more banana tidbits for you to get ape over. Check out our other videos or visit our website at www.10poundgorilla.com. I'm swinging on out of here. Ooh, 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 you're not subscribed, that's bananas!